2. August 1974. They sat on Dusander's back porch under a cloudless, smiling sky. Todd was wearing jeans, keds, and his little league shirt. Dusander was wearing a baggy gray shirt and shapeless khaki pants held up with suspenders. Wino pants, Todd thought with private contempt. They looked like they had come straight from a box in the back of the Salvation Army store downtown. He was really going to have to do something about the way Dusander dressed when he was at home. It spoiled some of the fun. The two of them were eating Big Macs that Todd had brought in his bike basket, pedaling fast so they wouldn't get cold. Todd was sipping a Coke through a plastic straw. Dusander had a glass of bourbon. His old man's voice rose and fell, papery, hesitant, sometimes nearly inaudible. His faded blue eyes threaded with the usual snaps of red were never still. An observer might have thought them grandfather and grandson, the latter perhaps attending some rite of passage, a handing down. And that's all I remember, Dusander finished presently, and took a large bite of his sandwich. McDonald's secret sauce dribbled down his chin. You can do better than that, Todd said softly. Dusander took a large swallow from his glass. The uniforms were made of paper, he said finally, almost snarling. When one inmate died, the uniform was passed on if it could still be worn. Sometimes one paper uniform could dress as many as forty inmates. I received high marks for my frugality. From Gluck's? From Himmler. But there was a clothing factory in Patton. You told me that just last week. Why didn't you have the uniforms made there? The inmates themselves could have made them. The job of the factory in Patton was to make uniforms for German soldiers. And as for us... Dusander's voice faltered for a moment. And then he forced himself to go on. We were not in the business of rehabilitation, he finished. Todd smiled his broad smile. Enough for today. Please, my throat is sore. You shouldn't smoke so much, then, Todd said, continuing to smile. Tell me some more about the uniforms. Which inmate or SS? Lusander's voice was resigned. Smiling, Todd said, both. Three. September 1974. Todd was in the kitchen of his house, making himself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You got to the kitchen by going up half a dozen redwood steps to a raised area that gleamed with chrome and stainless steel. His mother's electric typewriter had been going steadily ever since Todd had gotten home from school. She was typing a master's thesis for a grad student. The grad student had short hair, wore thick glasses, and looked like a creature from outer space, in Todd's humble opinion. The thesis was on the effect of fruit flies in the Salinas Valley after World War II or some good shit like that. Now her typewriter stopped and she came out of her office. Todd baby, she greeted him. Monica baby, he hailed back amiably enough. His mother wasn't a bad-looking chick for 36, Todd thought. Blonde hair that was streaked ash in a couple of places, tall, shapely, now dressed in dark red shorts and a sheer blouse of a warm whiskey color. The blouse was casually knotted below her breasts, putting her flat, unlined midriff on show. A typewriter eraser was tucked into her hair, which had been pinned carelessly back with a turquoise clip. So how's school? she asked him, coming up the steps into the kitchen. She brushed his lips casually with hers and then slid onto one of the stools in front of the breakfast counter. School's cool. Going to be on the honor roll again? Sure. Actually, he thought his grades might slip a notch this first quarter. He'd been spending a lot of time with Dusander, and when he wasn't actually with the old kraut, he was thinking about the things Dusander had told him. Once or twice he had dreamed about the things Dusander had told him, but it was nothing he couldn't handle. Apt pupil, she said, ruffling his shaggy blonde hair. How's that sandwich? Good, he said. Would you make me one and bring it into my office? Can't, he said, getting up. I promised Mr. Denker I'd come over and read to him for an hour or so. Are you still on Robinson Crusoe? Nope. He showed her the spine of the thick book he had bought in a junk shop for twenty cents. Tom Jones. Ye gods and little fishes, it'll take you the whole school year to get through that, Todd baby. Couldn't you at least find an abridged edition like with Crusoe? Probably, but he wanted to hear all of this one. He said so. Oh. She looked at him for a moment, then hugged him. It was rare for her to be so demonstrative, and it made Todd a little uneasy. You're a peach to be taking so much of your spare time to read to him. Your father and I think it's just... 
just exceptional. Todd cast his eyes down modestly. And to not want to tell anybody, she said, hiding your light under a bushel. Oh, the kids I hang around with, they'd probably think I was some kind of weirdo, Todd said, smiling modestly down at the floor. All that good shit. Don't say that, she admonished absently. Then, do you think Mr. Denker would like to come over and have dinner with us some night? Maybe, Todd said vaguely. Listen, I gotta put an egg in my shoe and beat it. Okay, supper at 6.30, don't forget. I won't. Your father's gotta work late, so it'll just be me and thee again, okay? Crazy, baby. She watched him go with a fond smile, hoping there was nothing in Tom Jones he shouldn't be reading. He was only 13. She didn't suppose there was. He was growing up in a society where magazines like Penthouse were available to anyone with a dollar and a quarter, or to any kid who could reach up to the top shelf of the magazine rack and grab a quick peek before the clerk could shout for him to put that up and get lost. In a society that seemed to believe most of all in the creed of hump thy neighbor, she didn't think there could be much in a book two hundred years old to screw up Todd's head, although she supposed the old man might get off on it a little. And, as Richard liked to say, for a kid, the whole world's a laboratory. You have to let them poke around in it. And if the kid in question has a healthy home life and loving parents, he'll be all the stronger for having knocked around a few strange corners. And there went the healthiest kid she knew, pedaling up the street on a Schwinn. We did okay by the lad, she thought, turning to make her sandwich. Damned if we didn't do okay. 4. October 1974 Dusander had lost weight. They sat in the kitchen, the shop-worn copy of Tom Jones between them on the oilcloth-covered table. Todd, who tried never to miss a trick, had purchased the Cliff's Notes on the book with part of his allowance, and had carefully read the entire summary against the possibility that his mother or father might ask him questions about the plot. Todd was eating a ringding he had bought at the market. He had bought one for Dusander, but Dusander hadn't touched it. He only looked at it morosely from time to time as he drank his bourbon. Todd hated to see anything as tasty as ringdings go to waste. If he didn't eat it pretty quick, Todd was going to ask him if he could have it. So how did the stuff get to Patton? he asked Dusander. In railroad cars, Dusander said. In railroad cars labeled medical supplies. It came in long crates that looked like coffins, fitting, I suppose. The inmates offloaded the crates and... Stacked them in the infirmary. Later, our own men stacked them in the storage sheds. They did it at night. The storage sheds were behind the showers. Was it always Cyclone B? No. From time to time, we would be sent something else. Experimental gases. The high command was always interested in improving efficiency. Once they sent us a gas code named Pegasus. A nerve gas. Thank God they never sent it again. It... Dusanta saw Todd lean forward, saw those eyes sharpen, and he suddenly stopped and gestured casually with his gas station premium glass. It didn't work very well, he said. It was quite boring. But Todd was not fooled, not in the least. What did it do? It killed them. What did you think it did? Made them walk on water? It killed them, that's all. Tell me. No, Dusander said, now unable to hide the horror he felt. He hadn't thought of Pegasus in how long? Ten years? Twenty? I won't tell you. I refuse. Tell me, Todd repeated, licking chocolate icing from his fingers. Tell me, or you know what. Yes, Dusander thought. I know what indeed I do, you putrid little monster. It made them dance, he said reluctantly. Dance? Like the Zyklon B, it came in through the shower heads, and they... they began to leap about. Some were screaming, most of them were laughing. They began to vomit and to... to defecate helplessly. Wow, Todd said. Shit themselves, huh? He pointed at the ringding on Dusander's plate. He had finished his own. You gonna eat that? Dusanda didn't reply. His eyes were hazed with memory. His face was far away and cold, like the dark side of a planet which does not rotate. Inside his mind he felt the queerest combination of revulsion. And could it be? 
Nostalgia? They began to twitch all over and to make high, strange sounds in their throat. My men, they called Pegasus the yodeling gas. At last they all collapsed and just lay there on the floor in their own filth. They lay there, yes, they lay there on the concrete, screaming and yodeling with bloody noses. But I lied, boy. The gas didn't kill them, either because it wasn't strong enough or because we couldn't bring ourselves to wait long enough, I suppose it was that. Men and women like that could not have lived long. Finally, I sent in five men with rifles to end their agonies. It would have looked bad on my record if it had shown up. I have no doubt of that. It would have looked like a waste of cartridges at a time when the Fuhrer had declared every cartridge a national resource. But those five men I trusted. There were times, boy, when I thought I would never forget the sound they made. The yodeling sound, the laughing. Yeah, I bet, Todd said. He finished Dusander's ringding in two bites. Waste not, want not, Todd's mother said on the rare occasions when Todd complained about leftovers. That was a good story, Mr. Dusander. You always tell him good once I get you going. Todd smiled at him. And incredibly, certainly not, because he wanted to, Dusander found himself smiling back. 5. November 1974 Dick Bowden, Todd's father, looked remarkably like a movie and TV actor named Lloyd Bachner. He, Bowden, not Bachner, was 38. He was a thin, narrow man who liked to dress in Ivy League-style shirts and solid-color suits, usually dark. When he was on a construction site, he wore khakis and a hard hat. That was a souvenir of his Peace Corps days, when he had helped to design and build two dams in Africa. When he was working in his study at home, he wore half-glasses that had a way of slipping down to the end of his nose and making him look like a college dean. He was wearing those glasses now as he tapped his son's first-quarter report card against his desk's gleaming glass top. One B. Four C's. One D. A D, for Christ's sake, Todd. Your mother's not showing it, but she's really upset. Todd dropped his eyes. He didn't smile. When his dad swore that wasn't exactly the best of news. My God, you've never gotten a report card like this. A D in beginning algebra? What is this? I don't know, Dad. He looked humbly at his knees. Your mother and I think that maybe you've been spending a little too much time with Mr. Denker, not hitting the books enough. We think you ought to cut it down to weekend, Slugger. At least until we see where you're going academically. Todd looked up, and for a single second, Bowden thought he saw a wild, pallid anger in his son's eyes. His own eyes widened, his fingers clenched on Todd's buff-colored report card. And then it was just Todd, looking at him openly, if rather unhappily. Had that anger really been there? Surely not. But the moment had unsettled him, made it hard for him to know exactly how to proceed. Todd hadn't been mad, and Dick Bowden didn't want to make him mad. He and his son were friends, always had been friends, and Dick wanted things to stay that way. They had no secrets from each other, none at all, except for the fact that Dick Bowden was sometimes unfaithful with his secretary, but that wasn't exactly the sort of thing you told your thirteen-year-old son, was it? And besides, that had absolutely no bearing on his home life, his family life. That was the way it was supposed to be, the way it had to be, in a cockamamie world where murderers went unpunished, high school kids skin-popped heroin, and junior high schoolers, kids Todd's age, turned up with V.D. No, Dad, please don't do that. I mean, don't punish Mr. Denker for something that's my fault. I mean, he'd be lost without me. I'll do better, really. That algebra, it just threw me to start with. But I went over to Ben Tremaine's, and after we studied together for a few days, I started to get it. I just... I don't know, I sort of choked at first. I think you're spending too much time with him, Bowden said. But he was weakening. It was hard to refuse Todd, hard to disappoint him. And what he said about punishing the old man for Todd's falling off... God damn it, it made sense. The old man looked forward to his visit so much. That Mr. Storman, the, the algebra teacher, is really hard, Todd said. Lots of kids got D's. Three or four got F's. Bowden nodded thoughtfully. 
I won't go Wednesdays anymore, not until I bring my grades up. He had read his father's eyes. And instead of going out for anything at school, I'll stay after every day and study, I promise. You really like the old guy that much. He's really neat, Todd said sincerely. Well, okay, we'll try it your way, slugger. But I want to see a big improvement in your marks come January, you understand me? I'm thinking of your future. You may think junior high is too young to start thinking about that, but it's not. Not by a long chalk. As his mother liked to say, waste not, want not, so Dick Bowden liked to say, not by a long chalk. I understand, Dad, Todd said gravely. Man to man stuff. Get out of here and give those books a workout, then. He pushed his half-glasses up on his nose and clapped Todd on the shoulder. Todd's smile, broad and bright, broke across his face. Right on, Dad. Bowden watched Todd go, with a prideful smile of his own. One in a million. And that hadn't been anger on Todd's face, for sure. Peak, maybe. But not that high-voltage emotion he had at first thought he'd seen there. If Todd was that mad, he would have known. He could read his son like a book. It had always been that way. Whistling, his fatherly duty discharged, Dick Bowden unrolled a blueprint and bent over it.